Praise the Lord, you reach. Pastor Priscilla Halling, let us pray. Father God, in the precious name of Jesus, we love you, we adore you, we worship you. We honor you for being wiser than humanity in all principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. We thank you for the peace that surpasses all understanding. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for being the comforter, the Father of mercies and the God of all comforts, the leading God into your righteousness. We thank you for the justification. We thank you for the clarification. We thank you for the validation and the revelation and demonstration of who you are. You are truly Lord of Lord and King of Kings, the great I am. In Jesus' name we pray and we give you the glory that you so rightfully do. Amen, amen, amen. I'm going to be coming from Matthew 16, 18. And we're going to delve into the word of God in a level in which we can focus on doctrine. We're going to focus on a higher level of proclaiming the word of God so that we can get a better understanding of what the body of Christ is all about and why God gave a proclamation, Jesus, to Peter that the gates of hell shall not prevail. against the church. There are many who are disassociating themselves with the body of Christ. They're disassociating themselves with the church. And that is unscriptural and unbiblical because Jesus said that the church would be built and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, if he told Peter, that the gates of hell should not come against his church. That means he gave gifts for the church so that the gates of hell should not come against it. If all who are in the body of Christ have received gifts from God, then the gates of hell would be impossible to come against it. That's why the Bible said that judgment should begin at the house of God. Because many will not be operating under the auspices of the authority of Jesus Christ, nor will they be abiding in the gifts. They will be operating in the flesh, in the will. And they will allow many to creep in. They will have their own agenda instead of the God-given ordained agenda. You cannot have a church without the gifts. The gifts are for the church. You can have other gifts used in other places throughout the world, but they are gifts in the church that helps strengthen the church, administer the church, hold back the darkness, the gates of hell from prevailing against the church. These are gifts that God has given that are necessary for the church. You will know that if you study Revelation, where it talked about the churches, where Jesus gave a condemnation and a revelation to all seven churches, explaining specifically what he found the church to be in need of and how they thought they were rich, but they lacked in much. You see, Jesus, in the writing of Revelation, had given, God had given John the revelation when he was on the Pontimus Island. He was in Asia Minor, and he was banished for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. In other words, he was being persecuted. And because he was being persecuted, the Bible says, blessed are those who are persecuted for my righteousness sake, for my name's sake. So he was being blessed. He was being blessed because God gave him a revelation. God gave him a vision of things to come. The Bible says that he received this 
about the churches in which the Holy Spirit had given him permission to write about it. We know that he spoke about several churches. He spoke about to Ephesus in chapter 2 of Revelation. He told them they were backslidden. They were persistent in service, strong in discipline, but with love growing cold. He said to Samaria, they were poor, but truly rich, facing a period of prosecution. We have a lack of understanding with rich is. He told Pergamus, the church of evil surroundings, that they were steadfast, but infected with heresy. He told Tathara, the church of good works, but they were harboring a false prophetess. He told Sardis, the dying church, and to Philadelphia, the weak but faithful church, and to Laodicea, the lukewarm, self-satisfied church boasted of her wealth while poor and miserable and blind. So we see how God gave messages to the seven churches in Revelation, how John gave an overall message from the living word of God about the condition of those seven churches. They all learned something about themselves that they did not know. He found them all to have some issues. Not one was without error. Not one was without concern. Not one was found not to have a concern that the Lord did not see. Now, despite of the different churches and their problems they had, in Matthew 16, 18, and I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Peter as the rock. Jesus is addressing Peter, whose name means rock, and stating that on this rock he will build his church. Some interpret this to mean that Peter plays a foundational role in the early church, while others believe the rock refers to Peter's confession of Jesus as the Messiah. You see where well, there's a controversy and what God meant that is being alluded to here. Peter confessed that Jesus was the Messiah. And Jesus is building the church. And he's telling Peter that I'm building my church, the rock. Jesus is the rock. The church is built on confession that Jesus Christ is Lord. But there's going to be a further illumination that he's risen from the dead. And in order to be connected to the body of Christ, we confess that he died and rose and forgave us for our sins. But while he was here establishing his disciples, they were part of the body. They were part of the church based on the confession that he is Jesus, the Messiah. The gates of hell or the gates of Hades refers to the powers of death and the forces of evil. Evil should never be able to prevail in the body of Christ. Evil should never be able to stay in the body of Christ. 
Because Christ has given gifts to operate that can destroy the works of the adversary. These are not gifts we can purchase. These are gifts that God gives. These are not gifts that we select and choose and determine where. These are gifts that God set and then operates accordingly. In ancient times, gates were seen as places of power and authority, often symbolizing the strength of a city or fortress. Now, the gift has nothing to do with where you sit. A gift has nothing to do with being controlled by humanity. You can't determine or control where the gifts will be. It's not one gift in a church. And some can operate under a multiplicity of gifts. Because God determines the gift, how they're used, where they're used, and who has them. Now, I did a message on the gifts previously. And gifts are not just in the church. You have gifts that are operating outside of the church. Because we know that God is omnipresent. And so the gift of wisdom, the, the gift of knowledge of the word is used not just in the church, but wherever we're at, if we have that gift, it's applicable in our life and everyday communication. We're always speaking wisdom into others' lives. Wisdom that is foundational on the word of God. It's not about preaching. It's about revealing knowledge and normal conversation. In other words, you could just meet somebody and be speaking with them. And you could just give them a gift of knowledge operating in the gift of knowledge of the word of God and be speaking into their life that will be applicable regarding their circumstances. That is something that God gives. You see, in ancient times, gates were seen as places of power and authority. That's why the Bible said the gates of hell shall not prevail because God will have his power and authority to protect the church. Not about you. The church don't belong to humanity. It belongs to God. It's not about a certain location. It's throughout the whole world. It's not about a color. It's about his spirit. Strength of a city or fortress shall not prevail. Jesus is declaring that death, sin, and the forces of darkness will not have victory over his church. He's conquered death. So believers, they will have eternal life. He's forgiven sin. So believers should come under the subjection unto obedience to be removed from sin. You're a new person. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. If you're a new person, you are recreated in his righteousness and holiness. It's impossible to be saved and remain the same. You can backslide, walk away from God and go back to your wayward ways. But it's impossible to have tasted salvation. And then leave it. We put on a new person. 
which is after God is created in his righteousness and his true holiness. He uses the word true to show you the sincerity of his holiness. There's only one holiness and that's him. Be holy because I'm holy. He gives you the attribute to be holy. He gives you the power to be holy. He gives you his covenant and his righteousness and his justification and his excellency that was within our earthly vessels to be holy. This is not about who's good and who's great. Good and great has nothing to do with holiness. That's a perception of how you perceive people. That has nothing to do with his holiness. We can see that today. There's a lot of schools that say great schools. That has nothing to do with his holiness. That's just a personification of what they think is great. We use a lot of words. But that has nothing to do with the representation of Christ. That's just a regular school. They're not even praying in that school. They're not even studying the Bible in that school. But it's a great school. See, we have to be careful how we take titles and put it on buildings and places and assume that it meets the qualification for God. The body of Christ in a church building should have the presence of God. While we don't have the Ark of the Covenant, we should still have the presence of God. There should be some manifestation of his power that his presence is there. Churches should be operating and supernatural abilities. That's what the body of Christ is for. It's to keep us separated from the world. So that means worldly standards should never creep in into the body, into the church, into the body of Christ. We're not to let the world come into the body of Christ and change the body. We should be so rooted and grounded that when the world comes in, it's not comfortable. It can't habitate there. It will either desire to be changed by God and be drawn by God and modified by God, transformed by God, or it will leave. Because it's not comfortable. It knows it cannot remain in the same way and stay in the body of Christ. It'll be convicted. And it will have to change. And it will be transformed through the renewing of your mind by Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit. That's why when you come, you should never remain the same. There should be a change. If there's no change, you did not receive him because he changes all lives that he touches, whether you remain changed or not. That's the decision you make whether to submit or whether to just observe authority over his will. But it's impossible to be in the presence of God and not experience the miracle working of God. See, the disciples, when they got together and began to minister, the Holy Spirit fell. It wasn't the working of the disciples. It was the working of the Holy Spirit. And the people were changed. They were drawn. We didn't have to use tactics that we use today to draw people to the body of Christ. We didn't have to use gimmicks. We didn't have to try to allure. All they did was preach the gospel and the people were drawn. All they did was praise and worship God 
and the people was drawn because the manifestation of the Holy Spirit did the drawing, which made the change. That's why the Bible says they were added to the body. God did the adding to the body and he poured his spirit out on whoever wanted to receive for the right reason. We know that Simeon wanted it because he wanted to make money from it. He never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit when the others did. And they told him, you need to repent because what you did was dishonorable to God. You didn't understand you can't buy this, nor can you sell the gift. It's not yours. You don't own it. And so when Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail, he's making a promise of the ultimate triumph of God's kingdom. Ensuring that no matter what opposition or trials come, the church will endure and overcome. Now, the church of God belongs to God. There's not one church that a person can control. But God sees the church as one body. But we have many entity, many places. But God sees the church as one body. That's why he spoke to the seven churches in Revelation. There were seven churches. He's the Lord over all the churches. He sees the church as a whole unity of a body, but different locations. The way we had one worship in Jerusalem, then he later established worship in other places through your churches. And so God's kingdom, no matter what is going on, oppositional trials that come, the church will endure it and overcome. It's going to endure and overcome because it has the gifts. Whether you know they're there or not, the gifts are there because God sets the gifts in the church. That's why our responsibility as believers are to pray that God's will will be manifested in the church. That the gates of hell will not prevail. You don't ever give up on the church. Because God established the church. The church is for believers. And the only one that will not appreciate the church, will not desire the connection with the church or unbelievers. Anybody that's a believer is going to desire the gathering. There's churches everywhere. And even when things are going on in the church, it's our responsibility to pray that the gates of hell do not prevail against the church. See, these are gifts. That's why you don't ever play with the gifts. That's why you don't ever take the gifts lightly. Because the gifts are necessary to destroy the wickedness and evil that comes up against the body. And if they weren't necessary, Jesus would have never gave them. He only gives what's necessary. He only speaks what's necessary. He only warns about what's necessary. Because he knows hell is going to try to come up against the church. So he's telling you, it won't prevail. And it won't prevail because of your goodness or your greatness. It's not about you. It's about his gifts that he places so it won't prevail. 
And our responsibility as believers is to pray that God will manifest his glory in the midst of his people. To keep the gates of hell from prevailing. Let's look at the theological significance. This verse is often cited to affirm the invincibility of the church through Christ. It reassures believers that even though there may be challenges, persecution, or spiritual warfare. Now look at what goes on in churches. Challenges, persecution, spiritual warfare. The church as the body of Christ will never be defeated. It's a message of hope, strength for Christians. The body is a place of refuge, a message of hope, strength for the Christians. That's why we come together to encourage one another. And a lot of times we don't realize that because when you first begin to be saved, you need to be encouraged. You need to be strengthened. You need to be taught. You need to be endowed with wisdom and understanding. You need to understand that there are gifts. So you pray for gifts. You ask God to show you your gifts. You ask God to show you your place in the body. You ask God to manifest himself in your life. You should pray to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Because that seals you and assures you. And during biblical time, whenever the word was coming forth, it would be so much Holy Ghost power behind it that it fell on multitude. One time there was 5,000 added to the church. One time there was 3,000 added to the church. The church grew in such a large number. It wasn't the people. It was the drawing of the Holy Spirit to the Son, to the Father. Because God adds to the church. You see, Jesus is speaking directly to Peter in Matthew 16, 18. One of his closest disciples making a profound declaration about the foundation of the church and its eternal resilience against the forces of evil. Churches should never have evil in it. Churches is not about your colors. Colors will not give you the power of the Holy Spirit. We are never to put our trust, our faith, and our hope in a color. That's not what God has proclaimed. We are to put our faith and hope and trust in the Lord. Gates of hell will come up against your colors. They are duplicating. We should see that now. We should have learned that from Revelation. Wickedness and evilness can't put on the whole arm of God. That's reserved for the righteous. That's reserved for those who've been washed by the blood of the Lamb in a covenantal relationship. They can't put on the garment of praise. They can't put on the doctrine of God. That's reserved for those God has endowed with. They can't Receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit.
but they are evil and wicked forces that can operate in powers, wonders, and signs. Deception and delusion. Because spiritual warfare is not cardinal. That's why our weapons are not cardinal, flesh and blood. But they're mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. Music is a weapon of warfare. When done through the operation of the Holy Spirit. They use many times in the Bible to fight many battles through praise and worship. God fought the battle. All they had to do was worship God and he fought the battle. That's why music is so important. Not music. Because many do music. And when you use the term music, music is a word that's used in a multiplicity of meaning. But what an, an unsaved person cannot do is worship God in spirit and trust, truth. What an unsaved person cannot do is music, worship in the anointing. to connect with the heart of God, to move on behalf of God in a service where healing takes place, where visions are manifested, where revelation are exposed, where demon, demons tremble and flee where prophecy comes forth. Where a word of encouragement is manifested. Where the presence of God is so mighty that you literally fall to the ground. And awe of the power of God. See, you have to understand what was happening in biblical times, that God's presence was so strong that many couldn't minister in their own flesh. They just couldn't do it. See, we got to get out of this. Are we hands? Are we feet? Are we eyes? Are we ears? That was just a metaphorical explanation about the body parts and how they relate to the body of Christ. God determines that. We don't. And so when you study Matthew 16, 13 to 20, in the broader passage, Jesus and his disciples are in the region of Caesarea Philippi, a place known for its pagan worship and temples dedicated to false gods. Jesus asked his disciples who people say he is, and they give various answers such as John the Baptist, why would they think Jesus was John the Baptist? Some say Elijah. Why would they think Jesus is Elijah? Or one of the prophets? Jesus then directly asked his disciples, but whom say ye that I am? Many can be in the Bible, Many can be in the church who heard about Jesus, but don't know who Jesus truly is. Many can be in the world who heard and hear about Jesus, but don't know who he is. And except Jesus reveals himself to you, 
you really won't know who he is. You'll just know what others say about him. So when he asked his disciples, they gave answers what others said. He was John the Baptist. He was Elijah. He was just a prophet. So Jesus asked them again, saying, but whom say ye that I am? You're telling me what other people say. But who do you say I am? Can you really tell somebody who Jesus is to you? That requires knowing who it is, not hearing from other people. But that requires the Father revealing to you through his spirit who he is. Peter responds, confessing that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus praises Peter for this revelation. But he acknowledges that it was only given to him by God the Father. And this sets the stage for the statement in verse 18, where Jesus speaks of the future of the church. All believers in the church will only have the knowledge of who Jesus is through the revelation from God himself, the Father. You can't come to the Father except through the Son and even be made manifested except through the Spirit. That requires a revelation from God. That's why an unsaved person can't read the Bible and get understanding. They can get carnality understanding, but they will never be able to get spiritual understanding because it has to be revealed to them. From the Father. You have to have a relationship with him. Not book knowledge. A living relationship. We can look at all the software applications. There's over 10 or 12 of more software applications. You got I. You got Word Search. You have Logos. You have all these different Bible software that you can use to do Hebrew and Greek in exegete scripture. We could give you scholarly and doctrine. Doctrine, exegete of scripture. We can impress you with all the Greek and Hebrew language. But except you have a relationship with God, you just have information. You just have knowledge and knowledge puffs up. But a relationship keeps you humble because you understand you wouldn't know it except God revealed it. That's why God is the wiser. Some things he will never reveal except you have a relationship with him. And when he reveals it, it's through his revelation that keeps you on. Because you know it's coming from him and not people. Peter wouldn't have known who Jesus is except the father revealed it to him. Jesus knew. Nobody would have known who I am. Except the father tells them. The devils know who he is. The demons were with him. They were fallen angels. So they knew who he was. They were angels. Angels have more knowledge than humanity. They are spiritual beings. Celestial beings. Not human. In body form. 
They can take on a body. They can oppress a body. They can possess a body. Because they are spirit beings. We should know that with witchcraft and voodoo that they used to do over in Africa, they may still do, where they will make a doll to represent you and stick pins in. And many people will get sick and die from having a curse put on through witchcraft and voodoo. We know some people use that today. They go to a voodoo doctor. to try to live forever. They go to voodoo doctors to try to put a curse on you. We know all kinds of sorcery and witchcraft and things that go on today. You can look around and find many places that have palm readers. Christians are never to get their palms read. We are to receive from God through prophecy, through revelation, through the word of knowledge and wisdom, what God has for our life according to his purpose and will. We're not to go to familiar spirits. that tries to tell you what your future it is by reading the palms of your hands. We don't operate in that. We have to be very careful because he's warned some of his people in biblical time not to get into that. Divinations, familiar spirits, You're not even authorized to operate in certain positions that God has not given you permission to do so. We know that to be true. In Bible, we have examples where some tried to use the power of God to cast out spirits. And one of the spirits says, I know Peter and I know Paul, but who are you? And the spirit jumped all over that person. See, you cannot fool spirits. They have knowledge that you don't have except God give it to you. That's why he said the gates of hell should not prevail because the gates, because the gates are being upheld by his power and his authority his supernatural abilities that's keeping the church uphill. It's not the people. It's the excellency of the power that he puts in people. We need to stop looking at good and great and look towards his excellency. Because people have taken good and great and made it insignificant. We need to look to his excellency, the power that worketh within these earthly vessels. We need to be wiser in being in alignment, in agreement with God. Now, Peter said, "Thou, God said, thou, Jesus, I'm sorry, said, thou art Peter. In the Greek, it means Petros. Jesus called Simon by the name Peter, which means rock. From the Greek word Petros, Peter, whose original name was Simon, is symbolically renamed to highlight the role he will play in the early church by calling him a rock. Jesus is emphasizing the, that Peter's significance in the establishment of the church. In other words, he's going to be 
working with setting up churches. We know Paul established a lot of churches. So Peter is going to be operating within the church with a special gift for the church. We know that to be true when Peter was preaching and the Holy Ghost fell on several. Three to five thousand, they were added to the church. That was a confirmation of what God meant when he told Peter that he was the rock. God was showing him right then and there what he would become. In Acts 10, 44, it says, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. That's why proclaiming the word of God is so significant. Now, the Holy Ghost can fall when you fall on you when you're singing, when you worship in him through music too. When everybody's on one accord with God, desiring him, the Holy Ghost normally fails. Oh, it can fall when nobody's on one accord or not. It's the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says they were astonished. As many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. You don't determine who receives the Holy Ghost. God poured it out not just on Jews. He poured it out on the Gentiles. Because the Holy Ghost adds to the body. See, we think we add. We preach. We minister through songs. And people come and join the church. So sometimes we think it's our preaching, our ministering to song, our different ministries we have available to offer the people in the church. And if we're not careful, we think it's our doing that adds to the church. If we add, it will never be the excellency if God adds. And that should always keep us humble because it's the Holy Ghost that adds. That does the drawing through the son to the father. If we add, the person may not never really come to God. They may just come to a church membership. And they will never be transformed because we can't transform you, the Holy Spirit. That's the transformer. And the adversary would like to get humanity in a position where we think it's our doing. And we always have to be humble and remember whenever we proclaim the gospel, whenever we minister through music, whenever we are teaching, whatever we're doing, we have to do it in the power of the Holy Spirit so the Holy Spirit draws. You know, you don't even have to be in a church to get saved. These people were out and people were just proclaiming the gospel. Peter, a church wasn't big enough to hold these people. And it's failed. No one put their hands on them. And they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter 
Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And we, when he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then pray they him to tarry certain days. So even after they were baptized in the Holy Ghost, he was now ready to baptize them with water in the name of the Lord. The most important baptism is the Holy Ghost. Humanity can baptize with water. That's just an outward expression that you have received the acknowledgement that you're going to be a part of life. The water is not going to give you the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That comes from God. A human can baptize you with water. But we ought to desire to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost is the excellency within these earthly vessels. You see, what God is trying to show you through scripture is that although you see human, human can do nothing without God. Although you see human orchestrating, never make humanity your God. You're not limited by humanity. Because God gives it to you. So humanity can't stop, nor can they give it. God determines when it flows. God determines who he baptizes. And we should never get to a point where we think we can do something without God. That's why he spoke to these churches. Because he was revealing to these churches. He's letting them know, you are backsliding. You are forgetting who I am. You having all these services. You, you're making all of these disciplines, disciples, but your love is the problem. You have a love problem. You're losing the salt of the earth. You're losing your love for me. But you're coming to all the services. You're keeping the rituals. You're disciplined very well. You show up for every service. You stay here all day. But you're backslidden. Your love is growing cold. You used to desire me. Now this is just becoming a routine ritual. You being infected with heresy. And you don't even know it. False doctrine is creeping in, but you don't even know it. Because you're not being sensitive to the movement of the Holy Spirit. You think you're poor. Because people are telling you you're poor. Because you're looking at other churches that appear richer. They have better building. They look like they have more money, more people, more ministry. So you're thinking you're poor because you're judging yourself with other people, other ministry, other churches. But you're truly rich. And even though you're per facing persecution, I'm telling you, you're truly rich. 
but you think you're poor because they are looking at you as poor because they're comparing you with worldly things. They're comparing you with what you drive. They're comparing you with the size of your church. They're comparing you with church building. They're comparing you with all the wealth of this world. And so to them, you look poor. But I'm telling you, the church of Samaria, you're truly rich. Because you're withstanding persecution. You're not succumbing. to the persecution. You're withstanding persecution. You're not changing to please the world. You're not changing who I am for a dollar. You are truly wealthy because you have my riches and glory. See, you can have a big church and be truly wealthy. You can have a small church and be truly wealthy. That depends on the wealth God puts there. Because the wealth is more than what you can take to the bank. The wealth is in your gifts. The wealth is in the power that God puts in these churches to keep that devil and the wicked one from the gates of hell prevailing. So he's letting Samaria know the gates of hell is not going to prevail against you. You're truly rich. I've put the gifts there. And you're operating within the gifts. And you're being persecuted but you're withstanding the persecution. They see you as because they don't understand the value of the gifts that are there. So they look at what you have, but they don't see the riches that you have. They're looking in carnality. They're not seeing the spiritual. And God is just showing us. That's why Paul said, but my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. There is something that God places in your life that you understand the riches of his glory. It's far more than what this world can ever compare to. See, all that we have today, while we love it and we desire, we cannot allow it to dictate our life where we can't live without it. We cannot allow it to dictate our life where we think it substantiates and makes us who we are. An unsaved person can have a better house than you. An unsaved person can have more money than you. But what an unsaved person cannot have or do not have, they can have if they give their life to Christ. But what they do not have is a relationship with God. And you can never devalue your relationship with God. Because it's your relationship with God that will give you more blessings and riches that you can never compare to. It can give you peace when there's chaos going. It can give you hope when everyone has turned against you and talking trash because they think you ain't gotten it, you'll never be that, you'll never make it without them. It can give you perseverance when people think they stop you from accomplishing something. It can give you encouragement when somebody make 
people think they got something that you'll never get. It can give you wisdom when people think they got something you want or you're trying to get something. It can give you comfort when things are going on and you don't even know why. Why the devil's bothering you? Because there are some things the devil knows because he's spiritual. A demonic spirit that humanity don't know. That only God can reveal. You see, the devils knew who Jesus was when they saw him. They even trembled at the knowledge of who he is. It's not enough to know who God is. You got to obey him. Because the devil knows who he is. That God is letting you know the devil knows more than you know at times. He's not human. He doesn't have to survive the way we have to. He's a spirit. And we're flesh. We're in a body. We're aging. The devil doesn't age. Spirit doesn't age. And sometimes we forget. And so when you have the body of Christ, because the Holy Spirit resides within, that's why God wants you to take care of your body. He wants you to appreciate because the spirit resides within. And that gives you strength when you're going through a lot in life. See, the devil cannot take your mind. That's impossible. If you're trusting in God. The devil can't take your mind. He can try to play with it, but he can't take your mind. If you're baptized with the Holy Spirit and you're trusting in God, he can't take your mind. He can't destroy your body. Because God has the power to heal it. That's why you don't tempt God. He can't really take your things. That's temporary. There's nothing God can't restore greater than what you had. And if God wants you to keep it, he'll never let it go. So don't think he, the devil can take anything. He got to have permission from God. We saw that with Job. See, God is trying to show us clarification through scripture that the devil is really has no power. Not really over the church and definitely not over you either. Because he's given us his spirit within us. the excellency of his power to assist, to reveal, to make known, to teach, to train. And then he's given us a place to come together to encourage one another and operate in the power of God. And we can do that wherever we are. But there's a difference when you are together, operating together. 
in agreement. The presence flows. Even when you're by yourself, the presence flows. And God has designed a church for the gathering. And the adversary has an attack on the churches. And rightfully so, he would. Because the churches are there to equip. To bring forth a message that God gives. So that when you have questions, when you're feeling concerned and not certain, and while you're growing in Christ, I don't care how long you've been pastoring, you still grow in Christ. You will never stop growing until you pass away. And then when you see them, you're going to still be growing. Because you're going to learn more about them when you see them face to face. Some things we don't know. And as we come together, seeking God, God moves over our lives and begin to reveal himself more and more to us. And so what we should be doing is praying that the gates of hell shall not prevail. And that God's will will be manifested in the church. We should never be putting nothing more higher than the church. Because that's what God has created for the believers. That is God's will. We are always to be in agreement with this will. For the perfecting of the saints. See, that is for the saints. That's not for the world. That's for the saints. That's not for the world. That's why you don't let the world come and tear up your home. That's for the saints. You don't let the world come into the church. They're welcome to come, but they don't change the church. They should be getting changed when they come. Because the power of God should be so great and mighty that you cannot remain the same. We're not doing it, not human. God should be doing it. It's not our responsibility to change a human. That's God's job. Our responsibility is to live for Christ while in the church and out of the church. We're to live for Christ. That's our responsibility. We are to allow the hand of the Lord to touch and change and put his purpose in your heart and fill you with the Holy Ghost so that you would have the ability to overcome the wicked. And see, the church is to pray for one another. When Peter was put in prison, because he was proclaiming the word of God, the church prayed without ceasing. 
That's all of our responsibility as believers to pray. And the Bible says while they were praying and Peter was sleeping, the door, an angel of the Lord came upon him. And a light shined in the prison and smote Peter on the side and raised him up saying, arise up quickly. And his change fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he said it unto him, cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. This is in Acts 12. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came into the iron gate that leadeth into the city, which open to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, now I know for a surety that the Lord have sent his angel and have delivered me out of the hand of Harold from all the expectations of the people of the Jews. That's what the church is about. That's why we are supposed to connect with the church. So that we pray for one another. We keep the church up in prayer as we pray for one another. That the gates of hell shall not prevail. That's our responsibility as we live for God. And the gifts should be operating so strong in the body of Christ. Not our doom, God's doom. We don't even know what the gifts will be needed. He puts them in the side. He knows what spirits are coming. He knows what principalities are coming against. Our responsibility is to pray that God's will be manifested. He knows what people needs are. He knows what people are going through. He knows the society. He knows the economic status. He knows the health of people. He knows the, the, the concerns of people. Our job is to be praying that God has his way. That's why you don't ever give up on the church. If you love God, you'll love his church. Because the church is a part of him. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. He's the Lord of the gathering. He's the Lord of establishing the body. For his people to come to the body. As we worship him. As we minister unto him. It's all about him. And he knows why he established it. It's for our benefit. To give us rest. To remind us of who he is. To release from the things that's going on in this world. To encourage and strengthen. That's God's design. 
and he has his angels. The Bible says the angel took Peter out of the prison because the church was praying. You see the power of the church. When things are going on in the world that's coming against the people of God, the church is supposed to be praying. So that God will work and move on behalf of them. They prayed for Peter. God sent an angel to release Peter. And Peter said, now I know for sure. We still have angels. That can release. That can operate. The seen and the unseen. And sometimes we're weakened because we become weary doing well doing because of all the distractions we have. That's why it's necessary to set time aside for God. So that we focus on him and not on what we need to do. We give him time so that he can communicate. He can prepare, instruct, warn, reveal. As we're thankful for all that he's done. No one person can control the church. No person can make it or break it. I don't care how many pastors that people have put out the church because they did things that were dishonorable to God. That doesn't stop the church. I don't care how many people attach themselves to the church that brought in heresy, that brought in the world. That doesn't stop the sanctity and holiness of the church. I don't care how many people we put in position. That doesn't stop the will of the church. God determines. And when trials and tribulations go on in the church, we ought to pray that God has his will. We ought to pray that the gates of hell will not prevail. Because that's the will of God, his church. That's his will, his church. And you can hear a lot of people speaking ill about the church. And just because the unsaved Say that the church is hypocrisy. Don't fall for it. Because the unsaved needs to know the church is not going to accept all kinds of behavior. Because they have to honor God. And if you're honoring God, you cannot include everything in the church. There's some exclusion. You're welcome, but you're not bringing the word. You're welcome, but you are not 
stay bringing the word. The operating of God's presence to be so high that you cannot remain the same. And the unsaved or those who are backslidden or those who are not honoring God should not be comfortable in the church. Certain things they should not be comfortable doing or saying. Because the holiness of God, the presence of God should be abiding so strong. Nobody can make a church anything but God. What you drive has nothing to do with a church. That's not going to make it or break it. What you wear is not, has nothing to do with That's not going to make it or break it. You don't make the church. You don't break the church. It's founded on Jesus Christ. Who's the head cornerstone. We're dealing with a God of power. That's higher than humanity. It's impossible for humanity to destroy the church. If he said the gates of hell won't prevail. You're not greater than demonic angels. God will put angels in these churches to go to spiritual warfare if you don't operate in the power that he's giving you. His church is not going to be destroyed. Yes, we understand that the spirit of God resides in these earthly bodies. Everybody knows that. But we are together together. You can't get into people's personal agendas. And fall into folly. You can't get into colors because the church is not your colors. The church is a spirit. That's why every church don't have the same color. That's just decoration. That's just man-made buildings. That people choose to put in. That God may give them a vision of what color to put in. Furniture, design. But the power of God, the angels that are in the church, that are all around us that we don't see, that's not even in the church. This angel came to a prison cell where Peter was at. Why the people pray? The operative instruction was that the people, the church prayed. We have to get back to the meaning of why God established the church. We have to get back to prayer. One of the foundation for believers. That's our communication with God. That's making our requests and supplication made known to God. That's engaging and communion with God. That's trusting God. That's asking God's will to be manifested. That's acknowledging that we need God to move. So anything that's going on the church should be coming together and praying about situations. And asking God to work it out. We're not supposed to be going to other organizations and institutions. They're lower than the power of God. 
We should be setting examples for other organizations and institutions. Not trying to change them. That's not our position. Our position is to live for God. But our example should be so rooted and grounded that we're not going to become wavering in our faith. So when they come to the body of Christ, we're not wavering. And they should be learning from our actions, our steadfastness, our unwavering faith. And the standards, the morals, the values, the principles, the statutes, and the will of God. You don't let anybody come into the body and try to change the standards and the will of God. Because the house should be headed up by Jesus Christ. And he upholds all things. By his word. We are to live it. Not just speak it and preach it and teach it. We are to live it. We are to be living epistles. Living epistles. Living epistles. I pray all the time for the body of Christ. That's what believers are supposed to do. Pray for one another. Because the body of Christ is under attack. It's always been under attack. Because that's where believers come. To serve and honor God. And who wouldn't want Satan? That's why Jesus said the gates of hell shall never prevail. No one gets the church. The church belongs to Jesus. No one should be trying to get anything. You are there because it belongs to God. And you are honoring God. Because he tells us not to forsake. If you love him, you're going to love his church. You're not going to try to destroy it. If you love him, you're going to honor him. You're not going to try to dishonor him. If you love him, you're going to obey him. You're there because of God. And so why I spent all this time doing messages, I always tell you, if you can go to a church, go to it. Anybody telling you not to, there's a concern. Because God says don't forsake the gathering. There's a benefit for you even attending. That's why you have to pray where God wants you. And he'll show you where he wants you. Because there's a necessity of the gathering. And yes, we have all of this media. And even when I used to watch a lot of TV 
ministry. I don't watch news. I watch a lot of TV ministry. Never was a big news person. Just wasn't. I don't spend a lot of time watching TV. I would still attend churches. And even when I stopped going for whatever reason, and it wasn't just a pandemic, I would still tell people, if you can't go, See, nobody gets the church. Don't be unwise with God. The church belongs to the Lord. Don't speak what you'll later regret. Because nobody takes his glory. And the gates of hell shall not prevail because he is in charge of the church. He's the head cornerstone. And he sets the gifts in the church. We don't set them. He does. He knows what's needed. You don't. He knows the spiritual warfare. You don't. He sees the unseen. You don't. He knows why he said the gates of hell shall not prevail. He knows hell is going to come up against the church. All your demons. Because people are becoming too equipped, too knowledgeable of who God is. And so he saw, even in Revelation, let me mess with Ephesus. Let me get some backsliders in there. They're coming too much to church. And they're disciplined. They're at Sunday school. They're Bible study. They're doing revival. They're doing everything. Let me put a little backsliders in there. Let me mess with this church a little bit. I'm going to have some backsliders. The love is not going to be the same. I'm going to put a little contention in it. Uh, let me mess with Samaria. You know, let me mess with their finances. Uh, let me take away some of their abilities because, you know, I don't want the church to prevail. I don't want the church to grow. I don't want the church to, to be honoring God. I don't want the church to set standards. I don't want the world to see the strength of the church. I don't want the world to know the power of the church. I don't want the world to be so persuaded by the church. So let me get into some of these churches. Let me uh, mess with the finance. And let me mess with the health and let me mess with the status, the morality, the value, the principle, the wisdom of the church. Because that's what God has established. So let me mess with what God has established to weaken the church. Let me let the world creep in. Mm -hmm. And Pergamos. Let me bring a, a little of the world in because this church is around evil surroundings. So let me let a little evil come into the church and infect it. And, and let me bring false prophets into the church. To tell you it's okay. 
what you're doing. God told me what you're doing is okay. God said there's nothing wrong with what you're doing. It's okay to be like the world. It's okay. Because we're supposed to love one another. So just accept what the world is doing. Just, just, just accept it. Love is truth. And it does not accept everything. Uh, let me stop these people in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me let me just make them weary doing well doing. I'm going to weaken this church because they're faithful. I'm going to weaken them. See, the adversary knows how to come into the church and keep up brewing some problems. Let me wear this pastor down. Let me wear him down a little bit. Let me wear her down a little bit. Because, you know, we're accomplishing too much. We're bringing forth truth. And truth will set you free. Truth will disarm the advices of the devil. And the devil don't want you to know truth. Because there's only one way, one life, and the truth. And I know many are telling you there are many ways. But God says there's only one. But many of you, many are saying there's many ways. There's many ways to get to God. But he said there's only one way. So let me put a little heresy in here. Let me put a little false prophet in here. Let me weaken your church a little bit. And let me put a little wealth in this church. Because the wealth will make you boast on yourself. The wealth will make you spend less time on your knees. Less time seeking God and praying for God's will and ways in the church. So I'm going to make this church wealthy. But while I make it wealth, it's going to be poor and miserable and blind because it's going to put its faith and trust in the riches of this world. It won't need me. It'll think it got the wealth. So it'll think it can operate because of wealth. But let me go remind you of Samaria. It's a poor church. So you look at Samaria and you see how wealthy you are because you're looking and comparing yourself to another church. But Samaria is truly rich. It's praying, it's seeking the will of God, it's trusting God. It's being faithful to God. Even when it's going through persecution. It's not going through organization and institution. It's on its name going to God. It's on its knees, fasting and praying. It's operating in the way that God says it should. And that's why God says we need to be so careful. Because we'll forget God. Now let me bring this to close. The gates of hell shall not prevail. The gates of hell shall not prevail. Ecclesia. Ecclesia. The church. Jesus says, I will build my church. Making it clear that the church is his creation, not man's, not woman, not human. It is God's creation. 
is built by God and for Christ Jesus based on the truth of who he is. That's the establishment of the church. We don't build it. God does. Yes, our hands may build a building. But a building built by human's hand does not make it a church. Satan has a church built by human's hands. What makes us a church is who's in charge. What makes us a church is who provides that's in charge Jesus Christ is built on the truth of who he is that's why he promises his church that it will endure and overcome Satan's power Satan's powers will not destroy the church. Nothing will stop or destroy the church because of the head. And the head is greater than Satan's power. God still performs miracles. He's still the true cornerstone of the Jesus Christ. Ephesians Let's get ready to bring this to closure. There's so much I can say about it. The church is a symbol of God's strength, stability, and protection. It's the foundation of God's truth. It's the establishment in the earth that God reminds you who's ultimately in charge. That he is the Lord of the same. He determines. He establishes. He builds. Except the Lord build the house. They that labor, labor in vain. Except the Lord watch the house. He's the watch over his house. The church will never be overcome by the forces of God. He said the gates of hell shall never prevail. So this is an encouragement to those in the body of Christ that's been dealing with a lot. Because the church has gone through a lot. Many organizations and institutions want to control the church. They want to come into the church for their personal needs and accomplishments. And we must remember what the church is established about. The headship. We must remember the power that God has given the church. To be a light force. Of who he is among the world. We must never forget. The covenant and what God has provided for the gathering. 
We must never forget that we minister unto him. We must never forget his sadness, his principles. And you have a lot of forces that would love to see all your churches close that are honoring Christ Jesus. They would love to see the churches close. They would love to not have people attend. They would love to see the churches crumble. But Satan will never prevail against his church. We have to endure and encourage one another, love one another, pray for one another. As God is our advocate and our intercessor. We must never forget why God established the church and that he gave us a declaration the gates of hell shall never prevail and how the church grows he adds he adds and when he adds he places who he wants there. He determines. And so we have to be mindful of what God is doing. The word of God grows and multiplies the church. See, this is not about one person doing one thing and another person doing another thing. When we let God determine what he's doing, then you'll see the magnification of the magnitude of the power in the myth of humanity's devices and will. I can only imagine how Peter felt when he was preaching and the Holy Spirit poured out. I've experienced that before. I was preaching and the Holy Spirit fell out among several. I didn't have to lay my hand. I didn't even know God was going to do it. I was just obeying God. And as I begin to bring forth the word of God at the place, the Holy Spirit just poured out. There wasn't anything I even understood. God was just doing it. I wasn't praying about it. He just did it. It wasn't me. It was him.
and people were filled. And some was added to the body. Some were already members. Because it's the power of God. And it's his message that he brings. And it's the drawing that he does. And this is not about a person. This is about his Holy Spirit. The gates of hell shall not prevail. That's a reminder to the body. The gates of hell shall not prevail. In other words, Satan's power will never destroy the body of Christ. Because the body of Christ is designed that Satan's powers cannot destroy. That's why he put some there to operate through them. To establish the authority and operate in certain ways. And we as believers are to pray that God's presence will hold back the darkness, will hold back the worldly conformity, will hold back everything that comes up against the body. But we don't. And we all have to be honest. We don't. We don't. That's why this message is to remind you that the gates of hell shall not prevail. So when people criticize the church and they criticize the Bible, and we can bring recognition to things that we know. But we have to pray. Not reminding God, but reminding ourselves that the gates of hell shall never prevail. So even when things happen and we become disencouraged and we become frustrated, we have to remember the gates of hell shall never prevail. And one person will never make the church. It's built by Jesus Christ. He determines. He determined Moses. To draw the people out of the out of um, Egypt, and he also disciplined Moses when Moses disobeyed him. So even with these churches that are going through a lot, we have to trust God and seek Him and pray for His assistance to help, whether it's financially or whether it's any other problem spiritually with spiritual warfares or opposition or whatever 
we are required to pray. And not just pray, but to actively be involved. That's what God has created it for. And so no matter what goes on in the body of Christ, we need to be reminded. And God will select where you need to go. If he sets an order, he'll tell you where to be. He can put you at a place you never thought you would be. He sent me to a place I would have never went on my own. If I would have selected, I would have never selected it. Because sometimes we are used to being in certain places. And then God will move you to other places. For different reasons. And he's showing you. How he builds. How he establishes. And what he's doing. And so we have to understand. No one controls it. God does. So you don't fall for things. That God is not even doing. Because the adversary knows that. And the adversary is very cunning. Very cunning. And we have to be careful. What we become entangled with. And what we allow. To receive. We're not a couple. For the body of Christ. That does not give us the power. And we have to be careful. With what we're picking up. And allowing. In the body of Christ. Because the world will come in. That's why the Bible says. When the enemy comes in like a flood, God will lift up a standard. That standard is to remind you of the banner of Christ Jesus. So that the gates of hell cannot prevail. His wisdom prevails higher. And a lot of times we don't see the necessity of his wisdom that prevails higher. The rock that is higher than ourselves. Let us get ready to go to prayer because we have a holy and righteous God. God is not into who stands or who sits. Let us not bring in humanity's understanding. But let us be obedient to the will and power of God. That's why praying is not necessary. You can pray and while you're there, you can pray while you're not there. Because the church will never be about a person. It will be about Jesus Christ and who he is because it belongs to him. The gates of hell should not prevail. It's not about Humanity, we can't stop the gates of hell from prevailing about Jesus Christ, who has the ability to stop. That's why it's so necessary to let God the Lord Jesus Christ operate and manifest himself in ways 
that we don't fully understand. And sometimes we become so complacent. And sometimes we forget it's not humanity. It's God. It's all about God. That's why we can never forget. We sell that with a lot of previous passes you can learn from. They started off well, but got God and then way went wayward. And some of these people lost their churches. They lost the position that God had allowed them to be in because they dishonored God. Because God is no respect of person. And so when Moses dishonored God, God disciplined Moses and the people. God still disciplines leaders and the people. So we have to be careful with how we interact. And we have to understand the church is throughout the whole world. And so for anybody who think it's about their us, it's unwise. Because your us would never be God's us, the Godhead. We have to even be careful how you fall for that. And that's what happens when we let the adversary to draw us off course of what God is doing. Be careful what you prioritize over God. Because someone else has motives. And you don't know what their agenda or why their agenda was even about that. That's why the Bible says be very careful. Because the body of Christ don't need you. You need it. And it's there for a reason. And it's not a color. Don't ever dishonor God by putting your faith and trust in a color. It's a Holy Spirit that's far greater than your color. That's what I meant when I said the body is Christ is under. It's so subtle as how it's being done to get you to take your faith off of what Christ has given you wisdom to put it on and to trust in what God has told you, to trust in him, his provisions, his doing. Because not every church is going to do your same colors. And one church doesn't have it all. They're just entities. That's why the Lord was in all your seven churches, even when they were going through something. He was still in all your seven churches. And he was reminded now. I'm your candlestick. I'm the one that stops the gate of hell from prevailing. So he gave accommodations about all the churches to let them know. He was the head of Ephesus. He's the head of Samaria. He was the head of Pergamos. 
He was the head of Thyatira. He was the head of Sardis. He was the head of Philadelphia. He was the head of Laodicea. He's the head of all your churches. He hasn't changed of his establishment. We change. Sometimes we let our surroundings come into it. Depending on where our churches are located. Sometimes we let certain programs come into the church that maybe God didn't authorize. We just do it for whatever reason. Sometimes we let many things come into the church. We try to persuade the body of Christ toward an action. But the church is to remain consistent. It is never to conform to the world. And the church is designed for the focal point to be Jesus. The head cornerstone. And not the agendas of this world. that if you're not careful, will change what the body of Christ is trying for. And so while we operate in love and operate on faith, we have to be true to what God has created the body for. And be strong in the Lord, not to allow the world to influence what thus says the Lord. Because of the sincerity of who Christ is. That's why it's so important for the body of Christ. And so we should pray consistently for the body of Christ. Don't ever put anything over Christ and what he has established because that's going to be here until he returns back, bring judgment against it, and take it out of this world. That's why he says the gates of hell shall not prevail. He established anything he established, Satan cannot destroy. Satan is not greater. In Christ, who established, and certainly he should have enough Holy Ghost power, stop Satan from trying to destroy the church. We should have enough wisdom from above to not conform, but stand strong in the power of God. And let God determine. Let us pray. Father God, in the precious name of Jesus, we thank you that you've given us the covenantal rights. The gates of hell shall not prevail against you. So as we keep the church in your hand, and as we submit and abide in your will, you uphold all things by the power of your word. In the excellency that is within these earthly vessels, which is the power of God and not us. We thank you, oh, Heavenly Father, before your wisdom. We thank you for the comforting message that you have it all in your hands. We thank you for the sincerity that you said you extend. You add, you grow, 
You make known. You reveal. You orchestrate. You uphold. You create. You build. And we are to yield and obey to you. We pray for the body of Christ. We pray that you will continue to set and establish and organize. You. We pray, O oh Heavenly Father, that you will reveal to the body that the gates of hell shall never prevail. What you have expanded. We pray, O oh Heavenly Father, that your believers would submit and obey and yield to your Holy Spirit and be found pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We pray that we'll be a light in this world. That we will not conform to it. That we will not be swayed, wavering, but we will be fully committed to you. We pray, oh Heavenly Father, that we won't let external influences change your will. Nor your morals and stand. But we will allow you to uphold all things by the power that you possess. We pray that everything we do will be done in the excellency of the power of who you are. And we will minister unto you as you minister through us. We pray that every member will be sincere and obedient to you. We pray that we will render to you what is due you. Love, honor, reverence, fear, obedience, worship, service unto you. We pray that you'll continue to manifest your presence and show yourself mighty on our behalf. We pray that you will have a turning around, a drawing back to your heart, a faithful commitment of reverence and awe. We pray, O oh Heavenly Father, that your presence will be manifested so mighty that flesh and blood will be reminded that you're spiritual and whole. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the reminder that the gates of hell shall not prevail. So that when we feel disencouraged, you encourage and let us know. You're still actively involved and engaged. And you know all things. And that our responsibility is to pray for one another, to love one another, to encourage one another. To forgive one another as you have done so to us. 
thank you, Father, for establishing the church that means so much. Thank you, Father, for manifesting your presence and being omnipresent. Thank you, Father. for having so many parts and, and, and location of your church, that there's a place for everybody. And you can set them in place. If they seek you. We thank your Heavenly Father. Because of who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The gates of hell shall not prevail. The gates of hell shall not prevail. Normally I always open up my messages or in my messages, some type of ministry through music. But I was not led to do so. So out of obedience, I just focused on the message because the message was so important that we receive it so that we can pray more about the body of Christ so that we can care, encourage one another Body of Christ, so that we can be active and serve where God wants his members to be. And so that we can be reminded that whatever the body of Christ may or may not be going through, wherever these churches are located throughout the whole world, that the gates of hell shall not. The gates of hell shall not prevail. We must be reminded of that. And we must operate under the obedience of the head of the church, Jesus Christ. 